Okay, so uh, this is Aaron Murakami, and today is October 14th, 2013. And recently we had just uh, released the uh, Lone Pine writings. I guess you could call it a re-release. And uh, I have uh, Eric Pollard here on the phone, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, can you hear me okay, Eric? Yeah, you're coming in fine. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, as you know, you know, we recently uh, re-released uh, Lone Pine writings uh, through A&P Electronic Media. And uh, Peter Miniman wrote the forward in this one. And uh, despite the fact that, you know, there are some strange things going on with this book, with it being released by others, being for sale, and being given away for free, and all this kind of stuff, despite all that, um, there's been a lot of uh, show of support by a lot of people still purchasing this copy uh, to support your work. Um, now, the title of it, Lone Pine Writings, um, do you want to give a, look, a reference or you know, explain exactly what Lone Pine is? This is, this is your, your address where you live? Well, I wouldn't say where, it's, where I live, but it's uh, uh -huh. an area that I gravitate around. And so that's, it's uh, pretty much, uh, geophysically, it's, uh, it's a very isolated location. And it's a good place to uh, live outside. I ended up there destitute. Somebody had sabotaged my car, and uh, my installation at Landers had been destroyed. And pretty much that was the end of it. So I crash-landed there, and uh, this book uh, writing gave me something to do. Okay. So you, went, so you got into the Lone Pine area after all the Landers incident. And um, so what, what got you to, to writing the papers, which were originally posted on uh, Energetic Forum? Well, which I just started off in a funny way. Actually, I, I got on the energetic form a lot earlier, but the person uh, there in San Anselmo that was supposed to help me with that uh, cut me off. And then uh, when I got the Lone Pine, uh, I figured, well, maybe I should start to do that again because I had no money for food or anything when I got there. And the car was uh, very, uh, didn't really, wasn't a good idea to operate it because oil had been drained out of something and the bearings were bad. But uh -huh. I was able to move around, so I tried to, uh, you know, go around town and see if there's some way, you know, I could work or whatever, try to get something going. So I went to the museum uh, to see what was happening there because I'm a biologist and a number of other things. So I figured maybe there's some project I can get involved with just to pass the time. There's about four or five locals hanging out in there, and, and we got to talking about... Uh, uh, the power company and some other things. So one guy had uh, he's got a, a chemistry degree and something. So he wanted to get into the details about my concept of what I call the plank. So we scribbled a bunch of stuff down, and for about three or four hours, we had a good time that morning, uh, you know, going through all this. And the guy uh, said, "Hey, that really helped me understand how all this works." So that's what started the book. At that point, uh, uh, one page of notes kept growing and growing. I really didn't have much of anything to do living in my car out in the desert. Uh -huh. So I had no reference books. I had nothing at all to work with other than my head. So I figured, well, let's reinvent the theory of electricity and get all the kinks out of it. And uh, so that started that book. Okay, so they, so the, uh, the Lone Pine writings literally was written on a clipboard in the front seat of your car. Yeah. Or in a notebook. Yeah, and, so, and uh, there wasn't really a lot of money for paper or beer or food or much anything to do it. So it was uh, it was a difficult process, but it uh, it kept going forward. And what's out mm -hmm. now is uh, is basically like one part of it, but there's still two thirds of it that hasn't been published yet. Uh -huh. There's um, so basically you would write these papers up, then you would send them off to uh, somebody who would then type them up uh, into energetic form for you under your username T Rex, right? Yeah, that's what I'd have to do. Is there, initially there was a guy there in town that said he would help me with it, but then uh -huh. he got all weird about it. Uh, something because I something in my writing interfered with his religious beliefs. So uh, there's somebody. Uh, uh, that sent me a whole bunch of people call, uh, like wanted me to call them, send me letters and all that. So one guy uh, uh, over uh, towards the East Coast sent uh, you know me a letter or whatever and said, I'll do this for you. And then I started mailing this stuff to him, and, and he put a lot of that together. Uh -huh. So, so then, I uh, what I do is I'd write it, and I'd go to the post office and drop it to the mailbox and launch it into uh, – into the cosmos, and uh, I had no way to look at it or, or right. anything, really. It was totally a blind operation. I just, uh, every week I went to the post office and, and dropped what I wrote 
in the uh, the mail thing there, and off it went into infinity. Right. So that's um, so yeah, you put it in a post office box, and it just wind up on the internet at Energetic Forum. And I think that the uh, that original thread where some of these older writings, you know, the original writings were being posted was in the Peter whatever happened to Eric Dahl. That's the name of the that's the name of the thread where where that was originally posted. Yeah, that's where it started off. So somebody had run across that title, saw uh -huh. my name on the internet. Right. The uh, guy there in San Anselmo who was helping me with some stuff and let me stay at his place. And then uh, uh, originally. He had kind of a bad attitude about a lot of that kind of stuff because he had some people in his house that, you know, were kind of uh, sapping his resources and claiming a bunch of free energy stuff. So he uh -huh. decided to get me on there as T-Rex, as kind of the, uh, you know, the uh, the loose, uh, vicious reptile to tear into that whole situation. So that's ultimately right. what I kind of did. Right. So essentially the, this uh, Lone Pine Writing book is a compilation of papers that you – had posted on Energetic Forum, and essentially they've been there um, free for anybody to go in there and read them and copy them and stuff for, what is it now, probably almost three years? So well, it's over it. three years now. The only problem uh -huh. is, is there's, it's so scattered throughout, you know, to try to find it would be very difficult. That's what makes the book uh, an easy process, because then it's all there. You don't have to search page after page. Right. So, yeah, so anybody that does want to look for them, you know, they'd have to scan through, you know, thousands of posts and and hundreds of hours just to find, find, find them all. And uh, with this book um, being published, uh, Lone Pine Writings, which is at LonePineWritings.com, um, you know, you have it all, all there. Now, now, the subtitle of the book is A Common Language for Electrical Engineering. Right. And so, so the basic um, concept of the book is that you're starting from scratch, basically defining each of the electrical terms, showing the basic math equations and the dimensions and how it all kind of ties together. And when you, when you mentioned earlier, uh, to get the kinks out of it, is it to correct some things that have been left out or have been twisted and contorted over the years? Yeah, basically the, the whole thing is a complete mess. And, uh -huh. and nobody knows what the definition of any of the terms are anymore. That's a big problem. Right. So you can ask somebody what a volt is, and you'll get as many reasons as there are people that you ask the question. Right. So, so I decided to get all that hashed out, and uh, and unify the whole mathematics, you know, the basic mathematics and dimensions of electricity, and get all that right based on you know a process that Steinmetz had started a long time ago, and so it all over heavy side, but mm -hmm. but it never never went any farther. Well, so, well no, when. Uh uh, you know, I was working with Peter on the book, and uh, it had already been compiled into kind of a book before, but it wasn't really formatted very well for people to be able to, you know, keep 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 the concepts in order. And after he kind of went through it, and he uh, kind of reorganized it a little bit better, more in a math book style, uh, so that it makes a little bit more sense to people, he was really kind of blown away and said, this is definitely where everybody needs to start. You know, if people want to get into the math and they're into electrical engineering and stuff at, at whatever level they're at, however many years of experience they have, um, definitely it's recommended that this is the book to start with. Well, the problem now in the electrical engineering world is no one really knows what's going on anymore. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like uh, nobody's at the controls. It's a real problem. Right. And things right. are starting to take a, a couple of real wrong turns, and, and so it's basically everything has to be relearned all over again from scratch. Uh -huh. So what's, what's in this uh, particular volume of these writings is, uh, is initially, for the bulk of it that's in that part, uh, there was a guy in Lone Pine that was assembling that for me, and he didn't want to bother with the equations or all that stuff, so I had to do it all in words. So that's about the least symbolic math book you'll ever find on the planet. Right, right. Everything's done with words and, and common, you know, analogies, uh, you know, dealing with, like, physical things that you encounter in life and not any, you know, abstract, uh, you know, Greek letters or any of that type of stuff. Of course, to the end, it builds up. Right. But it's still, you know, there's no sea of, uh, of uh, partial differential equations. There's none of that stuff. Well, everything is basically nothing goes farther than first year high school algebra. Right. So and ultimately, so ultimately, nothing really needs to. That's what's absolutely amazing about this whole thing is everything has been so overcomplicated 
uh -huh. that uh, the mirrorit of complications has become kind of like its own entity, and uh, and now the complications are running the show, and and the original content is all lost. It's completely backwards. So even in your um, you know more advanced stuff, getting into the four quadrant theory and everything, and uh, the other stuff that that you're working on mathematically, it's still just using you know, for what, first or second level high school algebra? Yeah, it's not, nothing goes past any math that you learned in high school, assuming right. that, you know, that you, you took math in high school. You know, every right. semester you took, you know, geometry. Uh, if you took uh, algebra one, geometry, and algebra two, uh, with some very introductory calculus, uh, a heavy emphasis on exponents, logarithms, and imaginary numbers in algebra two, it's all right. basically any, I learned all this stuff in high school. I started doing this stuff in high school. Right. Most of the complicated stuff, uh, uh, like normally you get mired in all these trigonometric identities and sines and cosines and all this stuff, and it gets way too complicated. They never tell you where it came from, but then uh, that's what they were teaching in school, but then when I had to get my FCC licenses and I had to do my own calculations and I had to study stuff at RCA, I learned the Steinmetz method and eliminated all that. Right. You didn't need any trigonometry. So that started to make me think, uh, what's the use of all this stuff if you don't need it? It's right. just, the whole thing just turns into a giant mathematical exercise. So my attempt has been to get everything back into uh, basic relations. You look at these, these very old books like from J.J. Thompson or, or any of these uh, pioneers in this area and their experiments, uh, nothing was very mathematically elaborate. It was all very basic. Everything was basic relationships. The experiments were very crude and simple. None of that complexity is required. It just gets in the way. Right. Now, when you mentioned that, you know, th this particular Lone Pine Writings book is just the beginning um, part, um, are the other parts, like, say, you know, part two, part three, or intermediate and advanced or whatever, are those already posted in energetic form? Oh, yeah, the whole, thing, so the whole thing's there. So okay, there so was it a just point hasn't point been it, What it did is it finally... Yet. Uh, the part that's out now is is like uh, the preparatory. One hundred and one. Yeah. So the preparatory phase gets you through. You understand what all the words mean, uh -huh. and, and how they connect together, and, and what they actually tie into it in a physical reality. Then it starts to get into uh, like various applications to that. Uh, there was a whole project that went on was to uh, to, to figure out at. Uh, at what impedance were the forces between two conductors on a transmission line neutral? In other words, the attractive of the dielectric and the repulsive of the magnetic, there will be a certain impedance that it would be equal. So I kind of threw that out as a contest, but it turned out to be there wasn't anybody out there that knew pretty much anything about this stuff. So uh, there's two other people hashed it out. So I managed to work all that out, uh, which led to some really interesting uh, uh, mathematical perspectives on uh, permeability and dielectric constant. So then, um, then uh, one of the people there at Lone Pine started bringing me books in the coffee shop uh, to read to help explain to him to understand what was going on. So then I started taking these books, and then I made whole series. Like one was called The Theory of Anti-Relativity. Uh -huh. uh, another one was called uh, something with Versers and Pythagoras and Steinmetz, and then I then I came up with a more practical thing called the Bolinus antenna, which you know showed you how to kind of like deal with the geometry of uh, of analog networks, computers, and antennas, and in the end, actually has a construction project that you can build. Uh -huh. And then the last one was um, oh, I think it was the theory of of uh, Electromagnetic induction, and there's another mm -hmm. one, the four quadrant. I can't remember, but Something energy exchange. Yeah, those those were. That was the finale. And those are going to be included um, as appendix, either in the book or. Well, no, these, uh, these will be this will be a whole other volume. There'll probably be two more volumes. Right. That, that's where a lot of, lot of material, a lot of material. The lot of material. The heavy material is all in that. The the material that's coming out now is is kind of. The first volume of possibly three. Okay, so we'll be uh, compiling those and releasing those at some point. And, uh, and if you're listening to this, and if you're not really familiar with uh, uh, the Lone Pine writings, I definitely encourage you to to get a copy. Um, the proceeds are going to uh, Eric Dollard and his work at UPD Laboratories, 
And um, if you go, uh, Eric's official homepage is ericpdollard.com. Uh, that's a middle initial P for Paul. So if you go to ericpdollard.com, that's his homepage. And on the right side, if you just scroll down, you'll see uh, the last three uh, releases. Um, the first one was uh, Four Quadrant Representation of Electricity, which was Eric's uh, presentation at the uh, uh, Bedini Lindemann 2013 conference at the end of June. Uh, up in North Idaho. Um, the second one is Wireless Giant of the Pacific. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, I would say, misinformation going around that that's not your book, but in reality, you did put that book together, and there's actually two books with the same title, one by a historian, and then there's yours, and uh, there's some uh, goofy stuff being posted online that your book has been freely available for the past 10 years online, which is not true because it wasn't even available until a couple weeks ago. Yeah, the, so book, the, the release of that book was actively suppressed. Uh, the release of the companion uh, historical resources study, there was, I was working with a, a local historian that was hired by the National Park Service to uh, engage in this thing that I'd started there. And, uh, right. and it, that pretty much got shut down as too. So I don't know if somebody is, I know, I know my work has been totally suppressed. Uh, as far right. as, as the historical resources thing goes, uh, I was advised, I could have been advised wrongly, but I was advised by people that are into that, uh, that that book uh, or publication or report, I don't know exactly what you would call it, uh, also was suppressed. And I had a copy that was given to me by the historian, and I managed to, uh, on the uh, earlier energetic forum interval, uh, I'd started an American Marconi uh, website uh, to right. deal strictly with the Bolina Station. Uh, we right. attempted to release the historic uh, report, and then uh, the person that put it on the Internet was uh, uh, very, uh, very uh, viciously threatened by the people right. that wanted to suppress it, and then that was the end of that. So I'm, I'm amazed that, that any of this is out. I, don't, I can't quite understand. Anybody could say it was available. I'd like to know right. uh, how it was available. Yeah, the, um, the Wireless Giant of the Pacific that you put together um, absolutely is not available, has not been available. The Historian one was on the uh, that Marconi website at one point, and then the links were taken off of the website so that it didn't um, show that, that that Historian's book was there anymore. However, Google captured a copy of the um, that, that book. So that yeah, so that book comes up in the search rankings because Google captured that because the person who runs the website never actually removed the document. He just he just deleted the links when he was uh, uh, threatened. Okay. So if you go into the actual website and look around, you're not going to see any. You'll see a reference to it, but there's no links to it. Those were all taken off. Um, but that PDF is still available through Google. But in any case. Um, the Wireless Giant of the Pacific, um, available at wirelessgiantofthepacific.com, is definitely Eric's book, and the historian's one of the same title is just included as a secondary reference, and there's a couple other documents in there that Eric gave talks on. And then the uh, third most recent one uh, that we just released is Lone Pine Writings, and you can find all those on ericpdollard.com. And if you click on any of the links right there on the page, um, Eric earns most of the uh, money that's going to purchase those copies in addition to royalties and stuff. And so this all goes to uh, Eric and his lab to help pay for expenses, equipment, you know, parts, supplies, that kind of stuff, and uh, even to help go towards uh, paying off the building and everything. Um, now, uh, I didn't get a chance to really announce this interview or do a live one where we had other people listening and stuff, so I didn't really get a chance to uh, get questions from others. Uh, however, I did uh, recently just get um, just a couple, one comment and then one question. One question somebody had, which I talked to you on the phone the other day, uh, maybe you can mention it or go over it with me, is he said in some talk or some paper somewhere you made a reference to an eight-pointed figure or something, something dealing with eight variables, and he was wondering why that's missing out of the Lone Pine writings. Oh, I don't remember that being in that particular part of the writings. That would be way too advanced for that. And so that, okay, so just being that that's more of an advanced concept, that's why it's not in the Lone Pine writings, as simple as that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine I would get into any type of uh, eight 
uh, you know, coordinate uh, bursar system when when uh -huh. people still don't really quite understand what an ohm is yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right. Okay. And then uh, let's see. Yeah, the only other question I had, you know, and again, I didn't have high time to announce that there will be an interview for anybody to listen. But what I will do is take this recording and I'll put it up on YouTube. Um, so plenty of people will be able to hear it. Um, not only will it be on my YouTube channel, uh, but it will be on your YouTube channel. And if you're listening to this right now, Eric has his own uh, YouTube channel, which I'm going to be putting up all the interviews and some of these old Borderland videos and, and some other stuff. And if you just search in Google for Eric Dollard, uh, you can um, go find his uh, Google uh, network profile and uh, add him as a friend in there. It's kind of like a Facebook kind of social network, but it's Google's. So I'd recommend going in there because that is uh, Eric's uh, personal Google profile, and that will link into his uh, YouTube channel. Um, there was somebody that uh, added you as a friend, and. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know this person. His name is John Paradise, and he was just saying, "Hey, Eric, what's up?" <laughs> so um, I don't know if you know him personally, or if there's any. No, I don't you know. particularly recall that name. You have to remember, you know, that I live in the bushes right. over feral humans. So when you start talking about YouTube and all that right, kind right. of stuff and whatever, to me, that, those things are all very abstract. Right. So, um, but in any case, you have a lot of supporters who are watching your work. Not a whole lot of them are making comments right now because that that Google profile page and everything is still fairly new. Uh, it's just you know a few days old. Um, but are, are there any messages you want to wrap it up with to uh, tell everybody that, that they'll hear here in this interview? Well, I mean, the whole writing thing has accelerated at a hyperbolic level. So there's another book coming out, which I think you're going to have out about the end of the month. Yeah, that's um, yeah. So there's a book that's going to be coming out soon, which is the four quadrant representation of electricity. This is the book that goes along with uh, Eric's presentation at the conference um, at fourquadranttheory.com. That's the presentation Eric gave at the conference with the PowerPoint and everything. And then there's a book which has been quite a monumental task just to put it together and get all the that, images. That, and that stuff book in. was probably. I have never uh, really assembled anything to that intensity, other than maybe the RCA book. And I did it in like one quarter of the time. And, and right now I'm working on the book that comes after that, which is, uh, is much more technical and monstrous. I'm presently uh, on graph paper transcribing 250 equations uh, just from the first uh, couple chapters of the book. Uh, mm -hmm. This will get uh, uh, way off into the three-phase theory, and, and I don't think uh, mathematics has ever uh, dealt with any of this stuff before. I think it's going to be a real first time for any of this versor algebra and polyphase theory and, and the use of the base epsilon and imaginary logarithms. And if I were to come out with something like this in 1890, my name would be all in the history books. But right. unfortunately, not too many people are interested in it, so I think it's uh -huh. mostly for my own entertainment. But... Uh, but I'm enjoying it. It's something that uh, a lot of things I've been wanting to uh, get working on for almost three decades. Right. That's so I, awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write something about that on the energetic form here pretty soon. So that'll uh, I'm going to scurry off to the bushes here in another day or two, and then write some stuff in English instead of uh, algebraic symbols and, and yeah. describe what this upcoming uh, uh -huh. mathematical project is. Now, I was, I was down there um, at your lab uh, out there in the desert, um, I don't know, three weeks ago, you know, maybe, maybe almost a month ago or so, and uh, had a chance to uh, uh, do a few other interviews um, with you that still haven't come out. The only one that I've posted so far is uh, on the Wireless Giant of the Pacific, the RCA book. And uh, so if you're listening, there are some other, you know, video clips and pictures and stuff that I took while I was down at Eric's lab, and I'll be posting those soon. Um, but I did want to mention that uh, uh, you know you and John Pol you know John Polakowski was also there when I went down there, and you guys are doing some good work back on the bench, um, getting together uh, that cosmic induction generator. Yeah, he's doing the. Uh, I'm basically uh, designing the thing and coming up with the overall plan, and then he's uh, doing you know engineering it all out and building everything. So he's pretty much about halfway into it. It's a massive project. Uh -huh. um, it's, uh, it's costing a lot of money, too. It's making his life difficult to keep buying all these expensive tubes and tube sockets. But at any rate, he's, he's caught some kind of fever over the thing. So right. uh, he brought he's, he has the transformers made, and he brought them out. Mm -hmm. And 
So I have uh, some old Navy equipment, which unfortunately was uh, really busted up on when they got shipped here or whatever. That hasn't helped anything. There's a lot of problems, but I got that pretty much debugged, so I'm expecting uh, probably in a month there'll be some kind of uh, video uh, presentation of uh, this thing, and it's, it won't be shoot lightning bolts. We don't have big transmitter built yet, but, uh -huh. but at least low power to show, you know, the progress being made and, and some of the unique features of this particular electrical network. Right. Yeah, those are some nice-looking coils he has up on the desk. Um, I was there, you know, taking pictures and filming them, putting the frame together and everything, and uh, um, now, so, so it's just a matter of upscaling that and then upscaling it with those giant FM, you know, or AM transmitters. Well, yeah, I have, I have this big. pair of 5 kilowatt AM transmitters, so 100% right. modulation. They put out 20 kilowatts, which is uh, quite right. a belt of electricity, uh, but the transformers for them will be about three or four times larger for that much power. Right. That's still kind of a, I don't even have the three-phase power or any of that in here yet. All I got is 110. I don't even have 220, so... Right. That's kind of holding that up, but the, but John is building the intermediary unit. He's he's building the uh, two kilowatt version that operates uh -huh. in the 160 meter ham band. So that uh, the, the the results of that uh, when it's fired full power will already be stunning. But the, with the thing with the AM transmitters will duplicate what I did in Santa Barbara. If I can ever get to that point, that's still about 25 grand off. Where right. you have a, it's kind of a flame speaker type thing, but not like anything anybody's ever made before. Uh, there's usually, if you have a group of people that are observing it, there'll be one person that will run in fear, <laughs> and there'll be two or three people that think that something's been tricked in their mind and will refuse to believe what they see, and then everybody else will be awestruck. Right. So well, Peter, Peter, Lind Peter Lindemann did get to witness this in Santa Barbara, and there was a. Uh -huh. uh, there was a, uh, quite a collection of people. There was a makeshift thing, you know, with smoke coming out the tube sockets, and the RF was, you know, driving everything in the house nuts and all that. And it, it could be heard four or five blocks away, and we played organ music into this thing, and, and it was stunning. But I don't know if I can get, you know, get to that power level uh, with the amount of income I have. But, you know, when people think, well, Eric's got his lab, well, I really don't have much of a lab. i got a building uh, that I stand to lose at the end of the year. Uh, it's a place to park my car and work on it out of the sun and uh, and sit down and write these books. Uh, pretty soon it's going to be too cold here. I economically heat the place. So um, I've only got one foot out of the brush and into uh, an uh -huh. enclosure. So, so the bulk of what I'm doing right here now is uh, about eight hours a day, seven days a week is devoted to this math book I'm writing. And then, right. then uh, we'll be doing the... Once uh, John gets back out here, then we're going to do a, a full-blown effort to get this thing all up and running so we can show the field, electric field around the thing and how it works and how it connects to the yeah. transmitter and how it receives telurically. And, uh, so at least, uh, you know, it won't be spectacular, but uh, it will show how, how the stuff works. Right. Well, as far as the lab, you know, we're, we're all going to work together to see what we can do to raise funds to see if we can save it, you know, which is uh, – going to be a little bit more challenging, but there's a lot of supporters for sure, and, you know, everybody's been witnessing the sabotage by you-know-who, but, um, but yeah, no, these, these giant transmitters you have, I mean, they're literally the size of, uh, fo like, photo booths. <laughs> they're, they're monsters. Yeah, they're so basically, be... uh, they're about the, the weight and the, and the volume of, uh, of my Toyota Corolla. Uh-huh. But yeah, extend it into like awesome. a big cabinet, so you could put right. uh, two refrigerators inside, moderate-sized right. refrigerators inside the cabinet. Right. But each one uh, will require a. Uh, let's see how much power do they use? I think they take about 10 kW each three phase to run. So uh -huh. uh, it gives me the advantage that each one has a 6 kW audio amplifier for the modulator. Is in effect what I or no? That's a yes. 6KW, 6KW, 3KW, 3KW. So I have a 6KW stereo amplifier. Right. So if I, if I had the means, I could really produce some stunning uh, audio displays with discharges and, and mechanically resonant. And, but at this day and age, you know, it costs so much money to do that stuff. You can't find it. I can't run back to RCA for tubes. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I can't go dig down a lease lights dumpster for light bulbs. It's gone days are over, so I don't know. It may not be possible to pull this back together for 
what might be the ninth or tenth time. Plus, I'm 61 years old, too, and I'm not too enthused about it, but uh, there's some people that are half my age that are, so they're willing to keep going, and then when they get going, I get going. Now, if you're listening to this, um, if you go to uh, Eric's Google uh, profile page, um, the big background picture for that is a picture uh, in Eric's lab where um, John Polakowski is working on a transmitter, and Eric's kind of looking over his shoulder to see what's going on. And so if you see that picture, that's, uh, that's the cosmic induction generator that uh, John Polakowski is working on. That's the tra uh, Old Navy transmitter. And then uh, in the background, you can see uh, some of the coils, uh, the transformer coils that are sitting on the desk. Um, and also while I was down there, I had a chance to meet, um, uh, I won't mention his name right now, but the uh, Glommeister who uh, Oh, the guy that, yeah, the, he, he goes out and he finds the surplus and brings it here. Right. And so I just happened to be there at the right time where he came with a whole uh, van load of stuff, uh, Glom, <laughs> lots and lots of Glom, a whole van full. And uh, um, I'll be putting up, uh, you know, some pictures and video clips so you can see an example of uh, some of the stuff Eric's looking for. So if you have, uh, um, you know, access to a lot of these old electrical parts, these old, you know, uh, especially Bell, you know, old Bell Lab equipment and this other stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll be posting some pictures and videos so you can kind of see some yeah, of that Yeah, basically stuff. any, any uh, uh, post-World War II uh, Navy radio equipment and, and any uh, Bell telephone, that's the two types of equipment I'm looking for. Right. Okay. Well, um, let's see. We're going on uh, half an hour here. I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up, but I'm going to get this up on uh, YouTube right away. And so again, um, if you're listening, um, please support Eric Dollard and his work down at the lab. Uh, go to ericpdollard.com. Uh, the mailing list you can join for free, and you'll be one of the first to know any announcements going out of you know any new releases or you know new pictures and videos being posted and that kind of thing. And also, if you do want to make donations, you can um, send checks or money orders directly to Eric Dollard at General Delivery. That's Lone Pine, California, 93545. And that address is on the top left of um, ericpdollar.com, uh, and that will go uh, directly to Eric. And so I guess with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Okay. Okay, and I'll talk to you later, Eric. Thanks okay. a lot for your time. Okay, right. take care. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.